Oh, we are live on Lost Property Investor. We bring the big names and we have the big fun. And as promised, five minutes late. How are you going anyway, Redham? What's 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 cracking today? I'm good, Jeff. I'm very excited to be with you and Joe um, and your audience. Um, I love the uh, preamble you've got there as well. It's brilliant. Love the energy. It's great. <laughs> I know. It's oftentimes it surprises me how quick the uh, the thing goes live. That's what she said. But anyway, no. So go go. Yeah, I don't know. This is yeah. We let it shoot it that out. Great, great. Uh, I'm excited Can't to have you on this call. Oh, yeah, I don't know. YouTube. So, how are you going away, Joe? What's what's happening, man? You you looking uh, silky smooth? What's you got a haircut and you look you you playing white shirt on? What's what's happening? Hey, I'm having a fantastic day. Uh, I've had a fantastic day. Um, did we did um uh, did move, trying to buy a property and we lost out because the price went above what we were thinking its value was, and uh, it's like a blessing and a curse, right? When that happens, because um, you set the price of this is my walk away limit, but when someone else gets emotional, that's none of your business as an investor, and you just you just walk away. Um, yeah. But it sucks when it happens because you're like, damn, that was a really good deal. But it's some of the like one thing I just just made me remember, and I think it's not something we've spoken about before. And now I'm taking over, so I'm still talking. So I may as well finish the <laughs> the thought. Is come on, Joe, come on. The property was listed for five uh, four hundred and eighty to five hundred and twenty thousand. It ended up selling for five hundred and eighty thousand dollars, where we saw value was at five hundred and sixty-five thousand, um, but it sold for five hundred and eighty thousand. So don't rely on what the agent puts there. Their goal is to get as many people through the open home as possible, and a low price is going to help do that. So uh, don't get too caught up. So that that was my day today, mate. But what about you, Jeff? How are you, mate? Yeah, yeah, similar. Yeah, bit busy and and just uh, finding 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 uh, things left, right, and center. And uh, yeah, it's. It's exciting times, but uh, yeah, also I, I think it's it's just interesting jumping from the corporate to the the to helping you out. So, but I'm also just excited to some of like Redham today. We're going to have an mm -hmm. epic conversation and excited to share some of the insights and wisdom you have. So, on today because you are a former Treasury economist and and it's quite polarizing the economist sort of thing. So we're going to talk about what interest rate sort of has done to borrowing capacity and, and some sort of forecast for what that sort of looks like. And we'll even jump into some, some ways around uh, some very sort of tips and tactics around borrowing capacity. But I think yeah. the, the really interesting part of it is going to be just where you sort of see, given your experience and you're an investor, you, I think I read your portfolio is over five or what was over $5 million at 30 <laughs> or something. Is that what it was? Yeah. We've been interesting. Odd years now, and our portfolio has grown over time. Um, we've kind of gone in the beginning with, uh, uh, you know, sub and and uh, in Sydney. So, done I think I missed all. Of, yeah. I missed all of that. I think your internet's super dodgy. It's not working. I think I missed all of that. Did you miss all of that, Jeff? Or is it just me? No, no. It's yeah. I think because you, you're on your hotspot, yeah. No, he's not in his hot spot. Okay, while he sorts out his internet, we are going to run to our next sponsor and uh, and then we will dive deep into this session because by that time his internet would have been fixed and no one would be none the wiser. Let's do it. Am I back? The amazing thing with commercial property investing is that in most cases, it's cash flow positive from day one, which means that you can drive those profits towards paying down the debt. There are instances with commercial property investing where you can actually have the property pay itself off over 10 years, which is absolutely crazy. With commercial property, you get massive net yield, so you can expect anywhere between 6 to 10%. And as we've seen in the current boom, these properties not only provide large cash flow, they do certainly grow wildly in value too. Now, with big rewards comes some risk, and this is why you should de-risk your investment as much as possible. And the way you do that is with expert due diligence. And this is why we highly recommend people hire professionals to help you along in your investing journey. Steve Polisi of Polisi Property is one such expert. Being a chartered mechanical and structural engineer in a past life, Steve draws on his analytical and mathematical skills to do that expert due diligence for you. 
With six years experience in the space, Steve has over 1,200 property transactions under his belt. He's the guy you want in your corner, crunching the numbers and finding the best properties in the best locations, along with ensuring that you avoid the mistakes. Steve has actually even written the book on commercial property investing in Australia. And not only is it a bestseller, I believe it to be the most comprehensive in commercial property investing on the market today. He's been generous enough to give us a massive discount for our audience of 50%. So use the code OZPROP, click the link below, get a copy today and start learning and getting on your commercial property investing journey. I think you're back, Redham, and well, and Jerry's on the big screen. Look at you. I'm back. So, sorry we, about that. I'm, I'm excited to, if for anybody who has comments or questions, drop them in as we go, and we'll sort of pick and choose as we're coming <laughs> along. But Redham, to who are who is this person in front of us today? So you are a <laughs> you graduated from UTS with an honors degree in economics. I don't know too many people who graduated from honors and UTS. So that alone is a, a big accolade. And you've, you're in. A five year corporate for five years in EY, so Ernst and Young, and an economist at Federal Treasury. So you founded though mortgage broking almost ten years ago now, and you and I think a lot's changed since twenty fourteen, um, and many sort of dips and uh, peaks and troughs in lending and sort of finance access. You now also run Australian Property Talk, a podcast, which is is a is a great one as well. But you won a heap of awards, all, all sorts of stuff as well. Uh, you've done. You might have done more than this. Eight hundred million in lending. That's that's insane. Eight hundred million. That's a lot of loans. Like I say, a lot of big max. But interestingly as well, you live in Sydney with your wife and two young daughters, and you love finance and property. You enjoy traveling and sports. So, what sports do you like, Redham? I want to know. That's my most take out of this. I'm dangerous. I'm I'm a big Liverpool fan. Um, oh. uh, I'm a bit. <laughs> it's a bit of a dangerous thing to say, but um, yeah, I, I wake up in the middle of the night whenever I can. Um, uh, in the wee hours of the morning to watch them play. So, um, the going? Oh, I think they, they they won against Newcastle recently, didn't they? I, I watched that game over in the UK. Um, I uh, there you go. Yeah, the, um, the gun, gunners are smashing it. Liverpool's not even in the yeah, anyway. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I just scroll down, it. scroll down, <laughs> <laughs> down the bottom. No. But yeah, that's that's a that's a very illustrious career. So before we get into the first sort of question, what yeah, which side of that is your most exciting sort of thing? Like, what what, what are you most proud of achievement wise? Ah, uh, yeah, good question. Um, uh, like, you know, it has to be my family. Um, you know, I've got two little girls. Um, I'm and married you know. to the love of my life, so um, that what? is for sure <laughs> my proudest achievement. That's gonna be, <laughs> nothing's gonna top that. But um, career wise, uh, you know running our business has been cool. Um, you know, I just started it uh, without really realizing where it could head um, with you to just helping people uh, get access to finance. Um, so we started that uh, in 2014 um, and it's kind of just grown from there uh, and kind of, it took off fairly quickly. Um, I think there was a real appetite in the market to get someone who understands like broader market dynamics, um, lending dynamics and things like that. And that's the angle that we come at it with. Um, and yeah, the lending stats are pretty cool. Um, we've got a team of 10 behind me um, that does most of our mortgage broking and lending work. Um, so it's fun. <laughs> you go. What are your thoughts, Sean? Unreal. I'm, I'm excited, excited for this one um, because you're an economist, technically. You're an economist. Um, you've worked in Treasury. <laughs> Um, but what, what I find, and is my, I think my audio is a bit dodgy. I'll try and fix it. Um, we're having some technical issues today, but um, I'm very excited to chat because you kind of, you're, you, you've got the economy side of things, the economist side of things, but also the real world mortgage broking side that's yep. super, uh, super, super important to actually get your, you know, your head out of the clouds and come down to real world of what does all these interest rate rises mean? How is this going to affect us? What should we be should we be looking at yield curves? Like, what should we be doing as an investor to kind of keep on the keep on top of this? And also, you're a massive port. You've got a massive portfolio yourself. Um, but Jeff, you always like to ask the first question: uh, What was your first property investment? Do you want to tell us the story of that? Yeah, how did it go? 
yeah, no, not that great, to be honest. No. <laughs> I, I, di I didn't start off um, with the Sounds best decision-making in, in mind. Um, so we've actually exited out of our first property, so I have results to that one, um, and uh, they're not that pretty. Um, so I bought my first few properties together, uh, like within months of each other, um, similar to uh, a few investors who you know come up with a plan and then begin executing that plan, and that involves carving up their, their total asset purchase like value into multiple bits. Um, you can hear me okay, guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. Loud and clear. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, we bought, at the time, there was, there was this government scheme called NRAS Properties, which um, was kind of like a, a subsidy by the government that really, for an investor, it boosted your cash flow. But you had to buy new properties and um, tenant them out to um, lower income households. So I bought a few of these in 2014. Um, and... What it did is it gave me cash flow. So the net cash flow after expenses at like a 90% loan back then was like 10 grand per property. So I split like a million dollar budget into three properties and got, you know, a net cash flow of 30 grand uh, for that. And I kind of viewed it in that way. Um, that's how I began. <laughs> um, downside to that is I sold them in 2020, 2021. Um, and, you know, there wasn't that much capital growth across the board of that million dollars, you know, it may have risen a little what, bit. In what total, was the, um, what was the research that went into that sort of decision-making? You, you were on property, property uh, chat at the time or what was yeah. the, what did you go about? Yeah. So I was on property chat. I just, you know, met someone there that was selling this sort of stock. Um, and like many investors who, you know, see prices like the actual dollar value of a price without understanding the mechanics to that you can often feel that it's expensive like it's just a dollar figure that sounds so large um especially compared to your income i was a graduate at the time you know earning 50 60 70 yeah. grand and the value of a house in sydney was like seven hundred thousand. i was just like wow that sounds crazy um mm -hmm. so you know it just seemed too expensive at the time um that was very surface level education as to how values in properties are formed um, but that's when I begun um, so I sort of naturally steered towards yield um, which provides a lot of safety in numbers a little bit because you know it's rented yeah. out and it gives you 10 grand in cash flow and with a 90 percent loan you'd only chip in 40 50 grand to actually purchase these and you're getting 10 grand back in cash flow so yeah. the net return on cash felt like you know you're getting a, a pretty healthy return on cash but you're taking on a lot of debt and risk to do that. So um, I began there um, and uh, you yeah, had some upsides, but in terms of actual results and compared to what other assets right. did over the time period, not that great. Yeah. Now, well, I think this is a very important point to, to touch on because I hear it all the time. Like, I feel like there's a journey for, for first time property investors and it starts with seeing a flashy ad for a house and land package and an off-the-plan apartment. And then they like, oh, okay, I realize that that's not the right path. Now it's cash flow positive. I need to be 100% cash flow positive, and that's where I need to go. And then they start to kind of shift into a bit of a mix of both and start to think about how can we grow the, the capital growth pie. So what were the real learnings that you took away from the pure focusing on cash flow side of things, and, and yeah. would you do it a different way? Um. It's hard to say I'd do it a different way because uh, that cash flow gave me comfort to leave my job. Um, starting a business is actually really scary. Uh, that, yeah. You know, at that age, you've got expenses. You don't really know what your income's going to look like. Um, so having a little bit of cash flow helped me start the business and the business has done fairly well. So in that sense, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's a regret or anything like that. Um, and yeah. would I do anything different? I'm not sure because I don't know whether I would have started the business if I mm. didn't have that cash flow. So that 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 that's tricky to, you know, Hindsight's a little bit tricky there, but in terms of what I would do, knowing what I know now, it speak to people who are uh, on your side. So like, you know, Joe, you're a buyer's agent. Um, got that right. You know, um, you run your own buyer's agent. You represent the buyer. Like that helps um, because you're, you know, vested in helping someone achieve their goals. So that, that I think would have been a smart sort of strategy. Um, instead, I kind of worked with someone who sold properties and that was the person who gave me the strategy. So that means that there, there's a bit of a conflict of interest there. Um, so I didn't fully understand that at the time. So th that's you know a concern to look out for as well. Yeah, Joe's got those questions that, uh, that, that, that we refer to every time somebody says, am I getting taken for a lens here? So 
I think I don't know if you can find this, Joe, but drop that. Yeah, in, drop I'll, those I'll in the pop this question up. It's it's the seventeen or sixteen questions to ask a buyer's agent to find out if they're a spruker or not. And uh, I just think it's so valuable to just make sure that you don't fall down that path um, because you know it, you you're going up a you know you're going up the financial freedom mountain. You're going up the mountain of of trying to achieve the goals that you've laid out. But if you go up one of these dodgy routes. You've got to come back all the way down back to where you were and then take that alternative route. So, it's kind of like snakes and ladders, isn't it, Joe? Like, you remember that game? Did you ever that's play probably snakes? better. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know what we missed? We missed the quote of the week. Should we Should we go back to that or are we, are we, are we has that ship sailed? Um, I feel like you've, pro- I feel like, uh, all right, up to you, mate. Up to you. Let's, let's knock it out. Okay. My, I'll go first. My quote of the week is, the actual results of an investment over a long term of years very seldom agree with the initial expectation. And that's by John, K- John Keynes. So Keynesian ec- economists would sort of appreciate that one. But where I was going with that is because a lot of economists make these predictions like you remember at the start of 2020, everybody was saying the, the, uh, the property market was going to drop and things were going to and, and people have sort of started to predict that once rates got to sort of the third, the fourth, the fifth rate rises. And yes, there's been a bit of a pullback, but it's sort of be interesting to see where we're sitting at. In the, and, and I wanted to kind of understand your views on an event that happened sort of four or five a week ago. The, S, the SVB, we'll t- talk potentially about the Silicon Valley Bank and, and what that, the reverberations, but that's my quote of the week. So what's yours, Redham? Uh, yeah, I'm not so sure I'd call it quote of the week for me. Um, I, had to, I had to really think about this one and, and Google it. Um, so uh, I chose um, the secret of success is to do the common thing uncommonly well. Um, now, the reason why I chose that quote is I actually find to be successful. Uh, so what I would tell my 22-year-old version of myself, I'm 32 now, um, is to be successful, you don't need to do anything extraordinary. You just need good habits. You need to do what you do really well. And if you do that, then relative to others, you'll probably do really well in your line of work. Um, so uh, you know, I'm mentoring a few mortgage brokers at the moment, and that's something that I tell them um, you know, all the time. You, know, you just do the basics right, and uh, success will come. Um, do it day in, day out. And you know, habitually, um, over time, it'll snowball into a, a level of success that works out well for you. And I find the same exists with property investing too. Yeah, such a good, you, such a good. You'd probably be a fan of the one percent um, or the slight edge by Jeff Olson. Have you have you read the slight edge? Or? I, you know me well, Jeff. For someone, for someone that we've just met. Um, so I don't read very much. Um, I should. I, I read a lot of data, statistics. AB, I, I read nerdy things, but I don't read books very much. I read one book a year. Uh, I read the slight edge a year at Christmas every year. I've done it for yeah. five years. Um, just a fluke. I just, I'm the sort of guy that goes to an ice cream store. I, you know, I have the same ice cream all the time. I found one book. I love this book. I'm going to read this book all the it's time. It's a good book. I'd highly recommend it. So, well, Joe, what is the, your quote of the week, mate? Give us a high level. What the hell is this book? You read it every single every single year. It's got to have some. What what kind of what does it do for you? What are the key takeaways? Like it it helps you think about. It, it's really about how to think. Um, and the key sort of takeaway there is, you know, if you have the slight edge over someone else, um, you know, and you build your mental disciplines to have that, you're going to do well over time. And I find that, um, you know, the, the common group of people that I hang around with that are doing really well, what they have in common is between the ears, actually. Um, it's not what they do. Uh, it's just how they do it and how they think. Um, and the slight edge talks about that a lot. And, and it really resonates with me and my mindset and some of the things I try and control with my mindset. Um, you know, that, that's, that's my favorite thing about the book. Yeah. I think the other thing it talks to is it's, it, it works in both. It's like leverage. It works in both ways. Like, if you like, if you go for a run once every day, or even a five k walk, if you do that, <laughs> that's only that. Do that once every day, every day for, I mean, as much as even five days a week. If you don't do that, that that will also that'll compound over time. So it's about really the theory of compounding. Whatever you do, if you do that yeah. consistently, then you'll get that result. If you sort of set the alarm, hit the alarm every day, mm-hmm. and don't go for that walk and wake up at seven thirty you'll end up sort of unfit and, and probably unhappy and, and all these kind of situations. So you reap whatever you do um, every day. 
those consistent action results. So Joe, what's your quote? I'm all for it. I love that. I'm going to buy that book and I will give you my feedback, Redham. Um, <laughs> my quote here is um, just, just pretty much about the basics. The investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Um, it's a good one. Franklin, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> nice and nice and easy one. I feel like you had a great story to your quote. I have very minimal story except for get educated and everyone who's listening to this now doing, doing the perfect things to get educated in their property journey because you are listening to, um, I mean, this is why we have wanted you on, Redham. You have a very unique insight that a lot of mortgage brokers, a lot of people out there don't have into this property market. So um, I'm keen to unpack the fun stuff and the more interesting stuff, Jeff. Um, and don't get me wrong, building a $5 million property portfolio is very interesting and I want to, we'll definitely be touching on that. Um, but yeah, let's dive in, Jeff. So what, first thing I think we, we, maybe it's not fun, but I don't know. Tell us about what interest rates have sort of, I mean, Joe's built it up to be really fun. I'm going to crush the fun party on the fun police. But tell us, you've got some charts about what rising interest rates have done to borrowing capacity. So what have, yeah, what have yeah, they done? Sure. I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about this. Um, talking about lending and property is pretty much my favorite subject. Um, I can oh, talk about it all day. I do it all the time. So happy to, can I share my screen? Yeah, yeah, jump Thanks, in. So, yeah. And I think this is one you put together a couple of months ago. So this may even be may even be sort of even more pronounced. Yeah. So look, a, a little bit, this is a little bit um, dated, but the data is realized now. So a, a little while ago, I came up with like, I wanted to test the idea, do borrowing capacities predict where house prices will go in Sydney? Mm. So yep. th that's just like a little soft sense test that I use to work out fair valuations for assets and things like that. Well, what I saw Solid was, premise. sorry? Solid premise. Yeah, yeah. Great like, it was, it was just a question that I was asking myself. And I'm like, look, it's actually really hard to do this data properly. Like I need to actually go through live customers over a five, 10 year journey. And the only way you do that is if you have servicing calcs and you run actual servicing mm -hmm. calcs and have an understanding of, uh, how banks apply these servicing calcs at different points in time. Um, so yeah, I, I ran the modeling on that. So we ran it on a, I think it was on a high income couple um, and just sort of looked at what can one person borrow year in, year out over 2017 to 2021. Um, and what it showed is from 2017 to 2018, there was a bit of a borrowing power drop. House prices fell too. Um, that was, you know, at the time, regulatory issues, Royal Commission, ASIC and things like that. And then five years, over the next five years, there's been, um, you know, a whole range of regulatory changes that help um, uh, support borrowing capacities and rate cuts that occurred in 2019, um, APRA changes and tax cuts that occurred in 2019. And what we saw is borrowing powers shot up and so did house prices. Um, so that was like the starting point um, of the research being like, look, there's a previous relationship that's existed over the past five years. Um, so what does that mean going forward? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm still on, guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're still on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just got, yeah, we just got the the main the main chart up on the screen. The, the interesting thing, um, have have you have you looked at have you, you probably haven't crunched the data from 2022? Yep. I imagine. What what is it sort I, of? I have, I have. So oh. the this research was done when rates began rising in 20 in what May June 2022. So all of this. The reason why I did this chart was to show that hey, borrowing capacities have a relationship with house prices. So at least in Sydney, because um, this was based on, this This is Sydney house price data, Sydney house price median data. So um, that if that relationship exists, I know that in 2022, that there's a big borrowing power drop that's about to happen. So this, is, this has already happened. Mm -hmm. um, borrowing mm -hmm. capacities have fallen 30% now, um, even more for investors, but fallen ballpark 30%. Um, so uh, I, I, we did this um, for the AFR this, uh, last week, but the, the high level statistics is if you had a two hundred thousand dollar income in twenty twenty two in this time last year, um, a household income of two hundred thousand dollars, you could with a ten percent deposit you could be buying around that one point five million dollar mark, um, which is a sort of golden number in Sydney at the moment with the first home buyer changes. To get the same borrowing amount today, one year later, mm -hmm. you need a two hundred sixty thousand dollar income. So to navigate these 30% drop in borrowing capacities, you need a 30% increase in income to just borrow the same amount. Um, right. So, yeah, this chart shows that borrowing capacities fell by 30% in 
2022. It's it's a little bit dated. I, I, like I didn't know what the cash rate would be at the time, but you know it's you're pretty close though. So. Yeah, I ran a few different scenarios. This is the worst case scenario here. It's beyond that. It's 3.6. The cash rate 3.6 percent. Um, so the, the total <laughs> drop is about 30 percent in borrowing capacity that's occurred. Um, so house prices haven't fallen by that much. House prices fell by about 15 percent in Sydney. Um, but what it does show is like if you look at the direction. Oh, oops. If you look at the direction of this chart, like it's like down in 2017 to 2018, house prices are up in these years and then down again. It's the same direction of how house prices have moved. So Sydney house mm -hmm. prices are moving along with borrowing capacity. So it's a little bit of a predictor. So if you can predict what happens to the borrowing capacities, you may have some insight into what happens to house prices. So that, that's kind so of why I did research. We, for those people who may not have seen previous sessions, and I think it's worthwhile even for those who have, um, what, how do you, what, what, is the, what is the definition of borrowing capacity? Uh, so... You know, when, whenever someone goes out to get a loan, um, the bank determines how much that person could go and can get a loan for. Um, to do that, they check their income, they subtract all their expenses, um, yep. and whatever's left over, you can borrow against that like monthly leftover amount that you have, and you can borrow a multiple of that. Um, so that that's your borrowing capacity. Um, so uh, for investors, it's particularly important because they need borrowing capacity to purchase their investments that's crazy that it went from what 1.9 million to two point and this was on was this on a 200k income was it it's a household combined income a 2017 level of so wage growth is part of these calcs um so in 2017 it's two people it's a couple earning 160 grand each um ah, so, 320, and now. um so why do you think these two are linked why are borrowing capacities and, and at least sydney house prices linked like this uh, to buy a home in Sydney, um, you need to. Get, most people need to go and get a loan to go and get that property. So, and we find working with a lot of Sydney borrowers is that a lot of the time to buy a home, borrowers need to stretch towards their maximums to get something that they want. Um, and even if, and they often adjust their locations and budgets based around their borrowing capacities. So, if you give someone thirty percent more money, um, we find that Sydney siders often take that thirty percent more money and then just move from you know uh, instead of buying in Tempe, I'd buy in Marrickville, or like I'd buy in the in the like slightly higher area, higher priced area because you know I could live there now, so I, I'll go and do that. Um, so I think that's the link between the two. Um, you know, just. The amount of money you get from a bank can increase your budget and hence prices move along with borrowing capacities or had had. Yeah. And I, I guess one thing that I'm kind of thinking about um, on this side of things is if interest rates go up. So I, I guess what I'm kind of getting here is it's access to capital. It's the amount of money that has been thrown out there in the economy for people to be able to borrow is what's going to help prices kind of grow and expand out. But um, if if they were able to get more interest rates went up, um, you would see prices go down based on on that. But what if the banks decided to increase serviceability and borrowing capacity for people? Like they came up with a more creative way, and um, would that change anything? Would that? Yeah, for sure. So within this chart itself, oh, let me go back to it. So within these charts. My back. Yep. So yep, yep. within these charts itself, every year these numbers, these dot points that are here, includes changes to bank policies that occurred at the time to improve mm -hmm. or like negatively impact serviceability. We mm -hmm. also ran future charts as to to answer this sort of question. What if banks change their policies? So um, one of the charts that we ran was um, currently uh, the prudential regulator, the person who sets the rules, the, the regulator who sets the rules on how banks lend money. Um, so that's called APRA, the Australian Prudential Regula uh, Regulation Authority. Um, this is, it's kind of like the, the policeman for Aussie banks that says you must do this when you lend money out. Um, they set yeah. the rule. Now, they, they have what's called a 3% assessment buffer. So that means that if you go and get a loan at 6% um, or 5%, the banks need to assume that the interest rate is 3% above whatever you're paying to in the assessment of how much you can borrow. So to work out what you can afford, they kind of assume that the interest rate's 8% if you're paying 5 to work out 
your borrowing capacity. What can you afford if interest rates were 8%? So that's a 3% buffer. Um, there's yep. talks of reducing that buffer back down to 2%. Um, and if it did do that, then it would boost borrowing powers um, quite substantially. Do you think now that, um, I, don't, I don't know how much you track that ASX RBA cash rate tracker, the, yep. the, what the bond yep. sort of, they, I think they do it 18 months. Do you think now that that's, that curve look like, looks like it's really flattened? Like it looks literally looks like it's about to go, I mean, you know, you're going to bring it up, AJ, or somebody going to bring no, it up? No. It could. But um, it looks like now they've almost, unless inflation kicks up, it, there may not be any more interest rate increases. And I'm not, I'm not going to go Glenn Stevens and say, no more ever because or till 2024 because that's or till 2025. So why it was, sorry, Jack. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that, Redden, with the uh, future yeah, of interest I'm, rates? I'm literally, I'm literally pulling up the chart. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was trying to at least. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's covertly pulling it up. <laughs> according, according to that, there's now a 0%, I mean, as of yesterday, so it could have changed today. So it does change from day to day. It was zero percent chance of a of a cash rate increase in April. Based wow. on, yeah. based on zero percent chance. Yeah, it was it was at yeah it was that sort of it was at about thirty uh, it was at about thirty six or sorry it was yeah last week it was about fifty percent oh sorry yeah sort of once they so yeah I th I suspect what happened is that uh, that sort of S Silicon Valley Bank situation sort of spooked a lot of um, a lot of economists around well, not economists but a lot of central banks around the world yeah yeah that's tr true uh, so maybe I'll just pull it up I yeah find okay. it. Um, so uh, yeah so what um, Joe's talking about there is um, the market expectations of interest rates um, yep. uh, that has come down rather dramatically over the course of the last uh, 10 days well six days um, since the RBA's last announcement, there's been a huge change in this chart that's on the screen at the moment. So this is mm -hmm. like the prediction, not the prediction, it's like what the markets are expecting interest rates to be at different points in time. Um, so uh, they use the 30-day interbank cash rate futures, which is kind of like uh, expectation of the RBA cash rate. Um, so you can see that the RBA cash rate is here at the moment, um, you know, it's at 3.6%. And the expectation is, you know, it pretty much stays at 3.6% for basically <laughs> uh, an extended period of time um, for a year. Mm. So. Yeah, the last, um, last, last, week, last week that was at 4%. So yeah, it, it, it was, was, it was at, three, at, peak yeah. at about, yeah, around October, it peaked at 4%-ish. A little bit well, higher so, than that, actually. Though. Like it was at 4.3% not too long ago. Yeah, so what about, what about, what did this look like in... Uh, what June twenty twenty two, like zero. No, no. So in June twenty twenty two, the markets had already expected that interest rates were going to rise. So the markets were a little bit ahead of what actually happened. So in June twenty twenty two, you would have seen the RBA cash rate this level be at zero. So the this little blue dotted line would have been at zero, but the expectation of interest rates would have shown that hey, look, the markets are projecting interest rates to rise. I don't think they were expecting it to go to 3.6 as at June last year, but by October, November, when it was clear that, you know, Barbier needed to increase interest rates, markets have been broadly correct, um, at least over the past year, in terms of the direction of interest rates. Economists have been wrong, um, but the market has been a good predictor of where interest rates have been heading. Not financial advice, folks. Don't don't rely on yeah, because this all this stuff can change at, at the as as it's yes. sort of seen, it can change very quite quickly. Because yep. oh yeah, there you go. Awesome. The, um, Thank you for that. <laughs> the interesting thing though is like well, let's just say you get an inf I mean, maybe we're going a little bit off topic here, but let's just say inflation in Australia for the for for Mar for February comes in at let's I, I don't know, I think last month it was at seven point three or seven point four. Let's just yep. say it comes in at seven point eight in in February, which it probably won't. But let's hypothetically say, yep. you, would you expect that they then sort of that would pick up again, or what? Do, what yes, are your thoughts sure. on that? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, for sure. So this is a daily moving chart. Uh, it, yeah, like yeah. it changes as the market participants buy and sell these things, um, and they do it based on the expectation of the rate path. So um, it's a really cool way to work out where interest rates are heading. The best sort of predictor of that is the market. It's, it's better mm. than, you know, me saying it or, you know, Bill Evans or, you know, some economist. The best sort of predictor is what's the market consensus, who 
are actually putting their money down, what are they yeah. what are they suggesting, and what are they buying and selling at? Um, so yeah, it will change, and this changes depending on data. Last, it's changed dramatically over the, over the course of the last week based on the SVB and the silicon, like the the financial contagion um, and the bank chaos that's occurred in in the US. Um, so that is part of the change. And also the RBA came out on a speech in when, on Wednesday after their rate announcement um, where uh, the governor whispered the words pause um, for the first time oh, in, a, in, he in a long time. You know, first at the time. end of it, he didn't say he's pausing interest rates. He mentioned the idea of a pause though, which has been different. Like we're getting in the weeds a little bit, but um, their communication is and what they say and the words that they say uh, you markets respond very closely to it so they choose their words very carefully um the fact that he chose to mention the word pause at all was a little bit of a pivot to what he's been saying over the beginning of the year um and because of that market expectations would have fallen a little bit because he did mention that hey we're thinking about a pause we expect to increase interest rates more but we're thinking about a pause so that was so, part so of what is um, I want to go back to what you the Sydney prices and borrowing capacity and how yeah. that affects it. Um, one of my questions related to that was, what about price range? What about in the lower end of the market and the upper end of the market and the mid tier of the market? Um, how does that kind of fit in? And then how does it work? There's a great question here. And the same theory for Adelaide and Perth, you won't see the correlation between borrowing ability and house prices, or is that due to low starting price, therefore a lower floor? Maybe just answer the, the yeah. I don't yeah, know, answer I, the like eight yeah, questions so, there, but <laughs> that's that's very true. Um, we just did a I literally just before I did this, I did a pod on um, house prices across different cities, um, and uh, mm -hmm. we analysed Perth and Adelaide. And yes, it, the question's a really good one because it's very true. Um, they are not people in Adelaide and Perth are, are when they're buying a home, they're far less likely to be. A decide like their borrowing capacity is far less likely to be a deciding factor in that uh, in, in their decision. So they're going to be getting like if I speak to an Adelaide client um, that's both in jobs um, working, they're going to be told, "Hey, you can probably borrow one point two million dollars." But they don't come back and say, "Look, I want to buy for one point two million. They say, "I want to buy for eight hundred thousand. So the borrowing amount that they're getting is isn't really impacting their purchase decision. Sydney siders have to make those choices because like when you go out there and participate and when you go buy something, you work out your budget doesn't stretch you very far here. Um, so you end up buying to what you can get. Um, so it's a little bit different in Perth and Adelaide. Borrowing capacities are far less uh, important there. But the cost of credit is definitely a, a factor in those markets as well. So um, Adelaide and Perth were both rising um, quite at a pace. I think Adelaide on macro data has fallen off a little bit um, and Perth has stabilised. Um, that is really just the cost of funds and the, and the interest rate going up. It's not borrowing capacities, but it's the interest rate going up that's driving that. Do you, do you sort of find, I mean, I don't know how close you get into the weeds of, of the types of properties people are buying and the price they're paying, yeah. but my, my sort of suspicion, what I'm sort of seeing in, in Adelaide and Perth is that at that sort of sweet spot, uh, let's just say around 500,000 or just below, there is some really sort of steep, really fierce competition and people are, people, people are buying these properties in two, three, like two or three days, like very quickly. So, but what, what do you sort of then sort of, I don't know if you'd see that, but get to the sort of 800K price range in those cities. Is it potentially a different story as well? Or? Yeah. Joe, are you, um, you mentioned the story at the beginning, um, your, the, at the beginning of this feed, um, what city was that purchasing? That one was South Australia. South Australia. Cool. Um, Pretty much yeah, Adelaide, so, yeah. Cool. Not much um, Adelaide. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Adelaide. Yeah. Same, same. Yeah. Oh, cool. So it's Adelaide. Um, yeah. yeah, so yeah. Who's Mount Gambia? Yeah. Sorry, people in Mount Gambia. <laughs> yeah, there's, <laughs> there's definitely more investment demand. Um, so Joe's a really good example of that. I assume you're representing investors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So investors. investment demand in Adelaide, um, vacancy rates uh low there very low there and rental incomes are very um like the yield is much higher so people feel a bit safer in high interest rate environments um so you know that's why those areas are less sensitive to um rate changes and uh borrowing power changes than um sydney for example sydney it's east it's an east coast story by and large sydney melbourne 
Brisbane, Brisbane's been hit really hard as well by borrowing power changes and by cost of credit changes. Um, and how are you? What are what are some of the what are the things that you see that that do grow the, the the prices then in in those different markets? Like, is there a is there another metric that you look at? Obviously, you look at borrowing capacity for Sydney, but have you looked at other variables for for growth in? Yeah, to be honest, uh, like um, I'm not sure if I can reference it, but PK, um, who we've done a pod with and has been on this show, he's the expert yeah. there. Um, that's his niche. It's his go-to. Um, my personal invest, like I would do this, but my I would love to do it. Actually, I find it a lot of interest. But my personal investing isn't in these cities. Mm-hmm. I I am very much a Sydney investor, and I the mm-hmm. the older I get, and the, the more capital I have, and the more advanced as an investor I become, the more rooted I get into Sydney because I know it really well. Um, so my investing strategy is a little bit different. I don't know these markets um, and what's driving them as much. I, I pay attention to the credit environment, and my job isn't to buy properties for people, so I don't follow that as yeah, closely yeah, yeah. as you. And because I think, work I think I'd love to see um, overlaid with with the graphs and your information is is stock on market or listings. So I think. What you and across the capital cities, because my my hypothesis would be is that as those listings went down, provided that access to credit didn't get too difficult or interest rates didn't go up too much, you would still see a sustain sustained level of prices. Whereas the the inverse would be true if listings increase and and yeah. and interest rates continue to rise, borrowing capacity continue to drop, then you would see uh, like supply and demand. Simple supply yeah. and demand factors. Yeah, well. at, at, at the end of the day, it's it's. There's no one metric, no matter as how hard we try, you create supply and demand metrics, you can create all this one, this one metric, there's nothing, no one thing that's going to drive the property market. So if you do try and we, we all try and gather all this information and just put it to one number, it just doesn't work. Every market is different and it's all affected slightly different. And you've got to think about the way you're investing in, in Perth, very different. Well, not very different, but slightly different to how you think about it buying in South Australia and very different to how you think about your buying in Sydney as well. Um, so yeah, there's no, there's no, there's no perfect answer for it. You can't, you, can't, you just can't make it. Um, but I'm, I'm very interested about your interest rates are going to stop. That's kind of the, like, they're going to just pause here for a little bit. But well, that's your kind of prediction of where we're going to go. Um, well, the market's prediction. I don't know about market, rhythm, well, it? the market. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. The market, <laughs> and I mean, the market's a good one to follow um, because that's a better one, yeah. It, for me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what, what impact do you think that's going to have on the on the property market? What's that going to look like in in, in your opinion? You got a graph here. Do you? Uh, got a graph. I, I, I oh, don't. Uh, well, we can we can show we can talk about the chart. Uh, Answering that question, it's it's hard to tell because financial conditions are very tight. Like it's not like not changing. If they don't, if they leave the interest rate at three point six percent, which is where it's at at the moment, to so borrow rates are early fives now, five point two five ballpark um, for an owner occupier, and closer to six for an investor, especially with an interest only loan. Um, so those interest rates are dramatically higher than where they were, you know, twelve months ago. So much much higher. So even if they don't increase the interest rate any further, it's interest rates remain quite high relative to 12 months ago. Um, yeah. So that, and borrowing capacities uh, in in the chart that I just had, if you look at it, it's at a, like a 2018 low point. Um, so financial conditions are very tight. Um, so we're going to be operating in that environment for the next few months, most likely at least, unless there's more bank collapses and then interest rates get cut. But, um, you know, um, so you, you, what you just mentioned there, um, why why would a bank messing up in the US mean interest rates in Australia? Let's say banks start to mess up all around. Like, why why does that impact interest rates? Yeah, I, I, we uh, we had a good talk about this actually. So oh, the perfect. idea is um, central banks want to slow the economy down. They want to slow things uh, down. They're willing to batter it a little bit, but they don't want things to break. Um, and mm-hmm. the thing that scares them more than anything is financial stability issues. Um, yeah. That is a bigger risk than, it's probably the only thing that I can think of that's actually a bigger risk than inflation in the short term. Um, they can't be put in a situation where um, the financial system uh, itself and borrowers are at risk and credit supply just stops. Um that is a real like economy risk um, and central banks are afraid of that. Mm. So that is why interest and what's causing this is and underlying the, the bank collapse 
uh, in the US, uh, if interest rates didn't rise and remained really, really low, then that bank wouldn't have collapsed. But when banks, when interest rates start rising, you start finding out which banks have made poor decisions, um, which businesses yeah. aren't doing as well. And, um, you know, you've lifted the hurdle rates a bit higher. So um, that is why it slows down interest rate increases because bank, central banks are afraid of financial stability consequences of um, banks falling over, really. Yeah, because oh, the... Um, so- I'm so glad you have a podcast because you explain incredibly difficult topics so simply. And I'm like, you need to start a podcast. You've already got one. Everyone, whatever you do, go go onto that because I can imagine there's nothing but gold there. I haven't listened to it, but I know you can explain things that are hard in simple terms. Um, the, can you explain this SVB thing and what um, why? You were talking about this. They get in trouble because they've they've got a lot of um, they've got a lot of debt and they've they've bought bonds. Like, yep. well, can you tell me so, how how that is all unfolding? Because this is so, this is quite topical. Like, we're talking about a U.S. bank here, so you know, the, my understanding of their financial system and, and the nuances of that is pretty limited. But uh, what's happened is um, through before after COVID, they got a lot of deposits from all these tech banks, um, all these tech sector. Um, businesses that were doing really well, um, they increased their asset size. So a, a bank's assets are the money that people put into them. So CBA's assets are our money that we've, um, sorry, um, these are their loans, but um, they had deposits from borrowers in their banks. So um, what they did with these deposits, what Australian banks do with, with these deposits is they lend it out to mortgages and things like that. So th- that's what they did. But they also bought bonds um, which uh, have fallen in value because of interest rate increases. So all the rate rises meant that what they bought their, what they used their deposits for, the assets that they bought with it, fell in value. Um, now that means that the bank is kind of, they use these, the money that they have to buy something that uh, isn't so good. <laughs> um, so <laughs> what happened then was, um, you know, People got wind of this and then decided, hey, can I have my money back out, please? I'm a little bit worried by you. Um, it was a bit of, a, bit of an, the old classic bank run, wasn't it? Exactly, yeah. yeah. You, you've, you've only got 50, you know, you've only got $50 in this bank, but you owe everyone $100. I don't want to be the one that can't withdraw my, you know, $5 out of here um, because half basically. of the people are going to get stuck. Yes, basically. So what they did is um, a bank run happened. So they needed to crystallize their losses to, to actually pay those deposits out to the borrowers, uh, to the people who, who deposited mm. their money into the bank. Um, they, needed to se- they needed to sell those bonds at losses. Um, and if enough people do this, they realize, oh, crap, this loss is big. I'm insolvent. Um, you know, I'm not making any money here. And in fact, mm. I, I don't no longer can afford to pay these out. So um, that's what caused their collapse. Um, And what the Fed did um, to protect the financial system very, very quickly, this is probably learnings from 2008 and financial stability issues that have occurred throughout the world. Um, You know, people in charge have studied this stuff now. And what they did was they came in the first day with a giant bazooka and said, we will give, we will promise every American, basically, if you have a deposit with your bank, that money is safe. Because if that bank falls over, you'll get that money from us. And this is the U.S. government. It's the Federal Reserve. How much? Because it, it wasn't two hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah. It was at two hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah, yeah, I think they changed. Which is, is going to cover that. most most people. I mean, a lot. Not, Limited not covers everyone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but no, no. Business... But these were big tech banks, right? This is yeah. when you get an investment of ten million dollars to grow and start your tech startup, and they're not going to spread those funds between two hundred and fifty thousand between well, however many banks that would be. Or 20 banks or something like that. Someone did yeah. math. So um, they changed the $250,000 rule, basically. And they said, unlimited. Like, you know, you got money there. Your deposit, like, you shouldn't be worried that your deposit, that you've got your own cash, you shouldn't have to store it under a mattress or, you know, spread it around institutions. Um, we will protect it. Um, so what that does is it, interesting. It, it stops the bank run mentality. It makes people feel safe being like, oh, look, this bank might be a bit shoddy, but, you know, the Federal Reserve's here. Um protecting me so uh that was because yeah, the, the financial system is all based on confidence like as long as the confidence or security is there then it'll continue to function fairly normally with stability as long, once that goes i mean we're sort of mm-hmm. emotional beings will start to uh, chop sure. and change or yeah 
question. Is this in interesting for people? I know we haven't had too many questions jumping in, but uh, are there any questions relating to any of that SVB stuff? That's super interesting. Or any, any, if, because we've covered a whole heap of stuff and I'm very cautious of uh, Jeff. As soon as Jeff gets on a, a mortgage broker here, he goes down these rabbit holes of stuff that I'm, I get very confused on. And uh, um, I'm just like, yeah, I just nod. Um, but you've been keeping me on track this entire time. Right? So I appreciate it. mate. <laughs> um, so that's, does that story happen in Australia? Um, like is the financial system set up similar to, or can we have bank runs? Can this thing happen here? Like, what are your thoughts on that? No, no not with our major banks. Um, it's very unlikely. We have the most well capitalized banks in the world. Um, so basically our regulator makes sure that our banks are very, very safe, don't take on much risk um, and have huge buffers in place. The downside to this is we pay more for, we have, we've got a, a bigger spread, if that makes sense. So we pay more for yeah, our mortgages as a spread. result, but we have very safe banks. So our regulator ensures that we have a huge insurance policy in case of instability. And whenever there's instability around, you know, our banks are so strong, they're unquestionably strong. That's the benchmark that they use. Um, so the risk of this sort of thing happening in Australia is very, very low. Um, and again, if it did happen, then our central bank would come in with that level of backstop too. Um, they're not going to just let depositors uh, lose their money. Super interesting. It's interesting that the bank just ba like bails out the banks because the bank initially has been the ones really to make the poor decision on there. That's a poor investment decision buy so many bonds when you should have looked at the markets like i mean well, it was all about risk it. risk management joe like they just i think I, I, was, I think they did about 10 percent of their oh up to 10 percent into these things i was listening to the all in podcast which is a couple of a uh, couple of tech billionaire guys like um they should listen to that one that's a that's an interesting podcast all these rich kind of blokes talking about poker and yeah will we'll, we'll lower bonds lead to a house boom 20 uh, 2.0 um <laughs> I don't know. It depends on what boom means and, and where, where are we talking about? Like, what, what is. Yeah. Can we go back to the chart? Uh, we've kind of modeled yeah, this yeah, question yeah. a little bit. Um, this question so, here will lower bonds lead to a house price? Yeah, yeah, what is happening? Interest rates are going to pause. That's your kind of assumption or what the market is, is saying here. Okay. Um, and the market. Um, yeah. What's going to happen in 2024? <laughs> so. Uh, again, going back to the initial bits of the conversation, our borrowing power is a predictor of what's going to happen next. So previously they have been, and even now they have, like 2022, 2023, house prices fell 15%. That's one of the biggest house price falls in 40 years. Unsurprisingly, borrowing capacities fell 30% during that period. So mm. uh, the, the quantum isn't right, but the size and direction, uh, the direction is right. Um, so what happens in 2024 is... Uh, a few different things help support borrowing powers. Um, so these things are not talked about, not that well understood. Um, and people probably care more about 2024 in 2024. But <laughs> investors are not buying property for in 2023 to generate a return in 2023. It's, it's generally not what investors do. They're buying returns over a 3, 5, 10, 20-year horizon. Um, so... What does it look like um, in 2024? So whenever interest rates cap out and stop rising, if they do, um, then you'll have the trough in borrowing powers. Um, so that's mm. this little point that we've modeled here. It's probably a little yep. bit lower now, so somewhere around here. Um, so what happens next is next year, there's a few things that are going to happen, likely to happen, that's going to support borrowing powers. Um, so if the cash rate broadly mm -hmm. remains the same, as where it is now, it's 3.5%, 3.6%, so it broadly remains the same, then the yeah. tax cuts that are in place that begin 1 July 2024 will lead to a 9% increase in borrowing power. Um, so this is because... This, this is for investors, right, Rodan? So this is modeling out... Individuals or for business? Yeah, this is modeling out a, a couple buying a home in right. Sydney. Um, okay. investors will feel the same thing. Then just percentages will be different. The numbers will be different, okay. but the direction yeah, yeah, yeah. will be the same. Um, yep. So, uh, you know, an investor, like borrowing powers begin to rise again next year because of tax cuts. The tax cuts alone make up nearly 9% of the borrowing power improvement, which is quite material. Like, you know, it could easily lead to yeah. 
you can like it's it's a big tax cut that people have so you know you need like three years of wage growth like if you're earning a decent wage 150 160 grand um now you need like three years of standard pay increases to make up this same tax cut um you can yeah. either just wait three years and get pay like little inflation adjustments to your salaries, or you can just get the government to give you more money in your bank account every every month, every week, or whenever you get paid. So um, that that's what's driving that improvement um, tax cuts. Um, and if you have rate cuts back to one and a half percent, which is more than what it was in 2021 when it was zero, if if rates are cut, you know, down to one and a half percent, let's say inflation goes away, the economy slows down, and the central bank begins cutting rates if they cut rates to one and a half percent to be honest like our modeling shows there's only one response to that and it's boom like you know the house prices will most likely if the economy remains solid and people are in jobs um which might be a little bit contrary but as long as people are in jobs and can afford to buy a home um then you'll find that borrowing capacity shoot up a lot depending on how low the cash rate goes um uh, that's partly wage rises, tax cuts, um, APRA changing that buffer to 3% to 2%. Um, uh, so some of these things w- we kind of expect to happen through the year um, that improve borrowing capacities. Um, and once that does happen, then you'll find we're probably at the trough of borrowing capacities around now, and it's going to improve at some point next year. So so you've kind of, you're kind of calling the, the bottom for the next, you know, six Six months, would you say? Six to 12 months, six to 12 months. Yeah. We, un- there's some uncertainty to that because I, I did caveat with as long as the economy and people remain in jobs. So throughout all of these experiences, even from 2017, mm. um, there was no recession, I mean, excluding the COVID temporary period, but there was no like mm. big economic recession that occurred where unemployment went up substantially. So um, what that means is when people are in jobs, this relationship holds. But if we have 10% unemployment and no one's in a job, it doesn't matter what banks are giving people. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, people people need to be in a job to go go and get this borrowing power. So um, that's part of the story too. Would you would would you say though that if if you get to if you're getting unemployed, even get up to about six percent or whatever it is, like sort of, would you say because wouldn't that lead to interest rates being cut? Yes. So yeah, which, most likely. Which then helps some people, but it's going to obviously there's going to be a lot of people that will be hurting because they'll yeah. So they'll, that's why they will have to decrease to to make sure that people. Oh, tricky. Can... If that happens, it's tricky because people who lose their jobs. I, like my story, I've done a podcast on this. I'm happy to talk about it. Is um, when I was younger, when I was 15, our family lost our family home, and that means a house was put on for sale that would not have otherwise been there. Um, and the wow. reason why that happened is both my parents lost their jobs. Um, so the pe- people, if they lose their jobs, they can't pay their mortgage. And if they can't pay their mortgage, that house goes for sale eventually. So um, that's why job losses are extremely dangerous to the Sydney housing market. And it's very hard to call a bottom if there's a potential massive, like a 6% unemployment rate is actually quite massive. Um it's a big increase in the number of people unemployed. Um, mm. That's it's, it's a huge increase. It's hundreds but of thousands. Are we near record low, near record lows of unemployment? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's great at the moment, but that could change. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I even read today from Facebook or Meta or whatever they call themselves, the, the platform we're doing this on. Um, don't hurt us, Meta, Facebook, whatever. It's, a, you got it's a Facebook group that you, <laughs> or the largest um, Facebook group. Yeah, they're, they're, they're laying off, I think they're laying off 10,000 workers or something. Is that Was that somebody else's, Apple or Meta? One of them, another 10,000. So, yeah, job losses will occur. Hmm. It's just the size of it. So that's part of the story as well. Um, job losses, it's a dangerous sort of time. So it's really hard to call a bottom when you don't know what's going to happen to the economy. There's just too much uncertainty there. Um, you know, if you can put in an assumption that the unemployment rate stays below four, four and a half, then I think you can pretty much call, call we're near enough to the bottom. Um, uh, and Sydney house prices are going to rise nearly a percent this month alone. That's double digit price growth for Sydney this month, um, like annualized yeah. out. So it's not like um, the market's doing fairly well price wise. Um, so you can probably call a bottom if you are certain that unemployment is not going to be an issue. But I'm not certain of that. And I don't think many people are. No. So what would cause unemployment to, to start to, well, why is unemployment on shaky ground for you? Um, 
I don't know. Because it's so low, Joe. How, you can't just keep going lower, man. It's like yeah, it's oh, like it's, it can like remain. It well. can remain here though, can't it? it? Can just stick here. But yeah, what are your what are your thoughts? Fing, right fing, fingers crossed. Um, you know, I never like to hear people losing their jobs. <laughs> That's not a good news story uh, for anyone. Um, it's just when interest rates rise, uh, it's typical to expect that um, unemployment will rise, and. To get inflation down, the central bank probably needs a little bit of unemployment to increase, and and they're expecting unemployment to increase a little bit um, to mm. four four and a half percent. Um, so, when interest rates rise, there's less activity. People are doing less things um, in the property world. Construction, for example, um, you know that's fallen dramatically. New build approvals are falling a lot, so that means fewer people are going to be working construction soon, and then eventually that leads to job losses. Um, so. That's what are, you, what are your thoughts of, uh, and a lot of immigrants were letting in uh, a skilled uh, migrants, so maybe that's not an issue, but let's just say you have, like, is, are, there, are there jobs available for all the people coming to Australia? Like, and and does, that, does that naturally increase the unemployment anyway? Yeah, it, it does. Um, so it, puts, it helps add to labour supply. So, uh, yeah. yeah, migration helps. Um, it helps so many things. It's like Australia's great miracle story. Um, the reason why we've gone 30 years without a recession prior to COVID is because we can dial up migration when we need to. And we are dialing it up to full blast and then some, and then some even more. Like it's like burning a steak, really, really uh, uh, char grilling it. Um, we, we are doing that because it helps uh, lower inflation. Um and it helps create demand and activity too. So it does both things because um, it adds to the supply capacity of the economy. So we can help grow the economy, but do it without causing inflation. That's why migration is such a powerful tool to manage an economy through this sort of transition period. And that's why they're dialing it up so much. This is what interests me, like with the whole property investing thing. I remember when I was when I was looking, I missed the Sydney boom. Um um, in what, which one, Joe? It all city yeah. is always booming, isn't it? And uh, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. But I was like, oh gosh, I really need to kind of get in so I can make make the next one right. And it's kind of like I see people trying to pick the absolute bottom, but it's like if you're out by six months or or twelve months or That's even two years, hundred thousand dollars, hundred fifty, whatever it is. Well, yeah, but if you're buying, yeah, I guess if you're buying well, like if you if you're not buying well and you're buying, you know, at market value, it's something that can't be increased. Um, but you're not buying a 1.5 million dollar property. Um, but it's like, what happens when you can't get back in, right? Like when your borrowing capacity can't afford you to get into that location that you previously could. Um, yeah. Yep. It's just, and there's no way to predict it either. There's no way for you know, even you're saying you've, you've even got. All these, all these cool charts that that say, yeah, everything's going this way. But it's like, well, if if one thing doesn't happen, it's not, it's not going to work. And, and an honest student at UTS, like, and, and Treasury, and and Ernest and Young. So this is not your average run of the run of the mill property investors bought two properties. He's got a six million dollar, or is it six or five? And one multi million dollar property portfolio broker. So done. Yeah, just interesting. Oh, this is great. My like yeah. take out to anyone who says this is. This advice, this sorry, these charts and stuff, um, people can, you know, I find investors can get lost in them. There's just so much information out there. Charts are scary as well. Like, what is this? It's like relationships between something and something. All of this is, for me, given I look at this stuff all the time, I actually separate my an, an analytical sort of thing, the macro story part that I like look at. I, I love talking about it. I love researching it. It's part of my framework, but really it's not, that important to day-to-day -day investing and the investment decisions I actually make. Um, uh, it's a small part of it, but really investors, like I find my own investing is best done separately to a lot of these sort of information sets that I produce. Um, so uh, I know that sounds really weird. Um, it's like, does that make sense? I think, I, yeah, I think it's well, practical because you, you, I, I see so many people and even in the forum, because I, I still monitor it somewhat like a hawk. You sort of say, oh, you know, everything's going to collapse and all this sort of stuff, or I'm not going to, I'm going to sell some things and, and wait out, wait for it to sort of cool, wait for it to come down a lot. And I sort of say, well, that's interesting, but how does that add? So I'd be interested to know, Redden, put your investor's cap on here, take your um, economist hat on. 
What do you, so you look at some of the macro, but what other things do you consider when you're buying property? Yeah, sure. So I, uh, sharing my story a little bit about investing. Um, so I started with those yield stories, um, but now I've moved to sort of growth assets in Sydney. So um, mm -hmm. I define, I got my own little checklist. Me and my wife are very particular about investments we buy. Um, we look at Sydney with the, the top level story is Sydney is a developed city with amazing institutional frameworks. One of the best places in the world to live that is going to rapidly grow in my lifetime. The number of people that will be in this city in my lifetime over the next 30 or 40 years is going to be three, four million people more than what it is already. That's Gosh, huge goal, yeah. given there's only 8 million people here. Um, that's like a 30, 40, 50, 60% uplift. Who knows exactly what it's going to be, but it's going to be so many more people. Now, the, Sydney is, a, these people, mm -hmm. these millions of people are going to go in infill areas. It's not going to be, you know, 3 million people come in and buy out in Western Sydney um, where there's new land estates. That's not where people want to live. It's not going to be where the, where all of the demand goes. So it's going to be existing areas of Sydney that change. Um, mm. So that's my starting point of why I love Sydney as an investment area. Now, overlaying that is what that, what does that mean is it means that the productivity of land, like what is that, piece of property that you're going to buy, the land that you're going to buy now, what is that going to look like and what can you put on it in 30, 40 years? So what is the potential of this land? When I look at something and when most people look at something, when most property investors look at something, they look at bricks and mortar, three bedrooms, you know, this, that, uh, yield and things like that. They're all part of the story. But what I'm actually looking at is I'm vi like visioning this particular area and this particular lot in this area and, and thinking, what is going to happen with this lot? So um, Sydney has changed rapidly and it is changing rapidly. And I've tracked certain areas over the past seven, eight years that have had rezonings um, and had uplifts in their productivity. And I find this to be highly predictable. Um, you know, it's not, it's not uh, rocket science to work out what areas will change. Um, it requires a lot of micro research lots lots of planning research my wife uh, works in planning she's a director at planning uh, she was a director at planning so she's got like a context of viewing wow. um viewing sydney in a certain way and I, I bring finance angles to it so that productivity of land uplift is where you make sort of alpha property returns um so uh, you know there's beta which is like a finance term for this is how much the market grows by. So how much is Sydney going to grow by? If it grows by 50%, that's the beta return. But how do you make alpha returns? How do you make greater returns than whatever the market does? There's opportunities in Sydney to benefit greatly from these productivity changes. And Sydney is probably the main city that benefits from this because Australia is a place where bill costs are very high and you only make money in land adjustments when the spread between an apartment price and uh, the, the bill cost is large. So, you know, if you upzone in Logan, for example, and you allow, you know, 40 level towers in Logan, but an apartment only costs 300,000 there, then the value of that land is not going to increase because it costs the same amount to build each apartment. But in Sydney, mm -hmm. if you allow 40 apartments on a block of land, each apartment might sell for a million dollars, but it only costs $400,000 to build an apartment or 500,000. So you make that spread over, yeah. over the number of yeah. units. So that's the the why cost of an apartment that. doesn't really change. The value, the, the cost of making that product doesn't really change. It's the land it's that it. grows. Um, and you're, you're predominantly looking at opportunities where you can put your own uh, units and blocks up on there because that's what the yes. council has said, you know, what um, I'm interested in putting higher density here um are you willing to share some of those suburbs that you see yeah, where yeah, you see cool. the be best amount of value okay cool well let's before we do that before we jump into some of those suburbs we'll just run our final ad and uh and then i'm keen to unpack where are these suburbs and uh <laughs> and some of the things that that kind of like you look at to think about like yeah this is this is why it's going to grow yep so, sure this live session is sponsored by Scott Agate from Hello House. Scott has created the world's first property negotiation as a service business. So what does that mean? Well, let's think about it. When was the last time you negotiated on anything over $100? 
let alone a property that is going to be one of the biggest investments of your life. The vendor, they have a trained negotiator on their side in the form of a real estate agent. That's kind of like you stepping into the ring with Mike Tyson after never training a day of boxing in your life. These guys are trained professionals and that's what they do day in and day out. And this is what Hella House does every single day as well. They negotiate on property to get the best buy price from the real estate agents. Scott Agate, he's the expert negotiator. He has been in this industry since 1995. He owned and operated three Bell franchises. Scott was the guy that was teaching these real estate agents all these agent games. He knows all of their tricks. Having him on your side is going to give you a massive unfair advantage and literally save you tens of thousands of dollars. Unlike other ways of purchasing property, Scott's incentives are aligned with you, the buyer, meaning the more money he saves you, the more money he makes, which is what you want. You need to have those incentives aligned. Scott has kindly offered our group a massive discount on the retainer fee for his service. So if you're looking to buy your next home or investment property, click the link below to get in touch. Oh, you really, you really, uh, oh, did I mute myself? Thanks, mate. No, oh, 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 where is, oh, he's, <laughs> he's gone to the bathroom. He's, he's coming. Sorry. <laughs> should, oh, yeah, my bad. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. He's back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's all right. I, I just, yeah, I, I outed you, I believe. Sorry, mate. Um, yeah, so suburbs. Shall we talk about? But I, I'm I mentioned before we get into that because I want to know: Have you seen other investors um, repeat similar things in yes. in other cities? Or you said that you see Sydney as the best opportunity. You explained why. But what about people who are, are sort of can't necessarily afford Sydney? They've got sort of maybe a 600k budget or whatever, 500k. What do you? Yep. Is it possible to replicate something similar in Adelaide or Perth? I mean, obviously, yeah, not exactly. Yeah, for sure. yeah like I, I think you adjust the strategy a little bit around those cities. Yep. So, um, you know, there's value adding opportunities. This is simply a value add strategy. Uh, uh, there's mm -hmm. value adding opportunities in these cities. It's tricky to work out whether that value add in these cities is feasible, like whether it actually makes sense to do the value add there because of bill cost yeah. and land values. But uh, yeah, it's it's definitely possible. Um, you know, and prices and land dynamics change over time. So in 30, 40 years, I suspect Adelaide will have high land prices too. Um, so, you know, uh, it may benefit from it at some point too. Yeah, but then you're also probably shifting from, you know, you would be looking at a, at a 20 pack of units or a 50 pack of units, I'd probably imagine right now. But if you're a, you know, first time investor, first time investor to a second time investor and you're thinking about this type of strategy it might be a three pack of townhouses um mm -hmm. to kind of keep with that that same kind of value add growth theme it's just not at the same level that you would do in sydney you might not buy a thousand square meter lot in in south australia so you can put 70 units on it would just be a bit silly just um, not meeting the market yeah yeah exactly um, yeah the interesting thing before we and we were getting suburbs. Sorry, I'm teasing. So you have to you yeah. have to keep watching people. But uh, no, the other interesting thing is is about do you do you sort of find oh, I don't know I forgot lost my train of thought. I was just find thinking around is there find. when you're sort of when you're doing this strategy do you, do you sort of are, are you looking at um, sort of how much you can um, how much money you can make out of that deal in the like you're, you're expecting a long-term time frame, I imagine, from the sound of it. You're, you're not thinking, oh, great, I'm going to... Actually, that's, that was my question. Do you pay... Are you willing... How much of a premium are you willing to pay for these kind of sites? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so... Good, good answer. <laughs> um, touching on something you just talked about, Joe, and, and previously, one beautiful thing about property, I, I love this, is you can actually compartmentalize your budget and purchase a little bit. So what I did, um, our incomes have grown and our financial posi positions have changed over a decade or so. And that is a very normal income life cycle for people and for couples all around Australia. Um, you know, when yeah. you start off mid-20s, you don't make as much as you do in your early 30s or late 30s or 40s, right? So mm -hmm. what you can do with property, and this is what we did, we bought one parcel of land in a rezoned area. Mm -hmm. um, we, we thought it would get rezoned within five years. It has got rezoned. It got rezoned in 2021. We bought in 2017. Um, fairly short time frame. Worked out. But we couldn't afford to buy a big parcel of land there um you know we were at an auction and, and i'm sure it was either meriton lendlease or, or someone was, was there mm -hmm. because they, they just had much deeper pockets than us so we can't compete with them 
But what we did was we bought one. And a couple of years later, next door came for sale. We bought that one. A few years later, the next door came for sale. Now we have three pieces of land that wow. combined, uh, it's, it's like, it's very much monopoly. The, the, the simplest way to explain it is you buy monopoly <laughs> to build hotels in monopoly and to build more density in monopoly. You must own things together. That's what monopoly teaches you. Um, and that is the strategy that's being applied here. And property allows you to do that. And, you know, in different cities, as an investor, you can do this. Um, you could buy, you know, one corner lot somewhere and then buy the two two next to it over time um, and, and do it when your budgets suit you. And hopefully, you know, you keep a little bit of firepower there. So when it does come up for sale, you can just buy it then. Um, so that approach does work. Um, you can that's, do that. Um, that's fascinating, isn't it? Uh, great, this is all inspired. Story. The, the reason we actually pivoted completely our entire property sort of strategy piv was a complete pivot when um, my wife met lang walker um who you know mm -hmm. is a billionaire billionaire developer. developer yeah so she worked at property she was a um, some sort of policy person um uh, at property council for a few years um so uh there she just met developers all the time and, and just met huge property players across the industry and she was lucky enough to meet lang walker and she told me the story that she had with him um i don't know they were having a drink and um, lang walker said told her about his investing journey back 50 years ago and what he did was exactly this um and it's what began him uh it's what was part of his like growth story his investment story is buying side-by-side -side assets and i think his was in miranda near the shopping mall there um that got bought out and effectively it was just a side-by-side -side play that did really really well um Meriton do this um, across Sydney always, um, you know, uh, big developers do this. Um, so, you know, our goals and aspirations are kind of, uh, you know, to do cool things in property. Um, so that's kind of the strategies that we've learned from um, from people who do similar things. That's a, great, that's a great way to think about it. The hard part is when it comes up for sale and you're not ready to buy. And then... Yes. Yes. <laughs> that, happened that's happened. Yes. that happened to me. I, I've, got a, I've got a house in the plant it was next door to the corner lot which is a lot larger and the goal was when that house came up and uh it was just when i started just started the business so i couldn't lend and i just had to watch it watch it go <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. so we'll wait another 10 years we'll be yeah, back get your friend we'll to buy it. <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's babies, right so very very good very good point okay so let's start talking about some of these um some of these areas um that you you see value but maybe more of the the higher level things that are happening in the back end that make you think yep. well, where so your assumptions are that's are that's more useful i think the suburb is not i mean the suburb's great but yeah <laughs> i think the, yeah, the reason behind is probably much more important yeah so if you look up planning documents from you know greater sydney commission or um uh, new south wales planning they have like a list of areas that they call like priority areas um that they're investigating for greater development so um planning authorities across the country know that they need to uplift zonings or release land they need to home more people and this isn't a sydney story this is an australia story we're going to have many more people in this country over, over the next 34 years so planning authorities need to work out where these people go and each city have their own authorities for this in sydney it's the greater sydney commission and new south wales planning they have a list of priority areas so that's a starting point um, for what makes sense um, and then individual councils also uh, who rezone lands um, also release lots of planning documents um and in those planning documents as, uh, just before this call i was reading campbelltown council's um planning document just out of interest um they've got a housing strategy that got released um and in that they've got like where they expect the certain number of people to be and they've literally drawn it out and said this is this is where it needs to be right now the feasibility doesn't make sense so maybe another housing cycle needs to happen before it does so there's so much information out there from different planning authorities that highlight where potential changes are um, and we just pay attention. I read and read and read. You know, I said I don't read books, but I read a lot of DAs and applications and housing. You read, you read the stuff that makes you money, right? I mean, you read these sort of planning documents, which a lot of people think are boring, but I think it yeah. you know, can be. And, and what do you look out in there? Because this is the hard thing about council. Council release so much stuff, and and there's so much information out there. Like, what are you what are you kind of looking for? I'm trying to work out where rezonings are likely to occur. So that's really the high level um, of what yeah. I'm looking for. And then it becomes very meta-analysis. Like you go through 
and you take a look at that area and that location, um, and there'll be very specific things. Um, so one area, uh, Arncliffe, um, I grew up there, I went to public school there. Um, so I know the area really, really well. Um, building a lot. Sorry? Yeah, they're building they're a lot. They're building a lot. And even like sort of Cogra way as well. Like you drive, just building like skyscrapers along those main sort of roads. I think Prince's Highway. Yeah, exactly. or Prince's Highway. I, I walked to public school from those streets, like as a, you know, as a little boy all the time. And all of that, like if you go past it now, there's just these signboards of like three lot things for sale at like, you know, double the value of each individual one if that makes sense because it's been yeah. rezoned from one house to 50 apartments and i just look at it and it'd be like wow that that's so cool that was like i'm 32 now i was what, 10 then you know it's 20 years it's a long story but the person who bought this has lived in it and is making they could sell the asset by themselves on an open market for a million but they're selling it for two million what an alpha return that they've earned they've doubled the, the market growth just from their own specific block of land while across the road um so as an example in Ancliff, you know, uh, the sp specifics that you look out for as well, um, there's a lot of detail that occurs so in Ancliff. There's a certain road. Um, RMS have caveats on one side of the road, but they don't have caveats on the other side of the road. If you pay attention mm. to that, you're like, interesting, RMS is going to knock down the homes here. So these aren't that valuable, <laughs> but it makes the other side much more valuable because you know that's going to get rezoned because one side doesn't have the caveats. So it gives you a lot of little clues um, and I pay attention to those clues. And then, you know, if you do this stuff all the time, you build a lot of knowledge and research and you get a, you get a feel for it. Um, and we've been doing it for years now. Um, and now that's kind of how it's worked out. Feels yeah, Harry, Harry. Trigger, trigger boss. It has he? That yeah, it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> yeah. So. That's um, it's interesting. It's just um, yeah. It's it's sort of because not everybody knows that, and maybe we shouldn't talk about this stuff on these podcast show. No, no, of course, of course we should talk about it. But yeah, you sort of you look and you say, well, these are the sort of things that can create outsized returns, and it's why you're not buying the prop, you're not buying the median house price of a suburb. You're buying the property that particular property in that suburb. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. And That's it, just and a high level strategy. Any other suburbs that kind of um, point of value to you? Uh, so Uncliffe's already had that change. That got rezoned in 2018. Um, uh, so uh, like Five Dock is a good example. I, I, don't, I don't know this one because I'm not looking to buy at the moment. But if I was, I wonder if I should say this. <laughs> um, if I was, <laughs> I, I, no. I would look into that because a new train station is going on Greater Northern Road, I believe, there. I um, uh, don't know. I'm not too sure what the audience is, whether they, they know where Five Dock is, but it's a pretty nice central premium area, um, you know, yeah. and a new railway is going in. Th those are the best. If, if a new railway station is going in, they have to upzone land around it to pay for that train station. Yeah. Um, so th that is something I, I'd look mm. at. There's new train lines going through lots of different areas and metro areas. And I, you know, I used to live right around the corner in, in Ashfield, and it's so you, you got you got Five Dock and you got Ashfield and you got Haverfield, and you sort of you could even sit, like Haverfield was like the really, really quite expensive sort of part, and then Five Dock is still expensive, but you should almost see the ripple coming over from Haverfield. So it's, yeah. it's just interesting you sort of say that. So some of these strategies work. Sydney offers so much opportunity and, and other cities will too. Um, you know, you just got to work out whether you're going to make, what you want to ask yourself is if you do this, you make sure that if you do get it right, <laughs> you made a call and you got it right, you got up zoned within a short time period, you want to make sure you're getting a return for it. Um, so that's, yeah. you've got to run your feasibility as well and make sure that, if it works and the value of the land increases. Not paying yeah. Much. And I wanted to the, oh, jump to some of the questions. There was a great question that says here, um, does Renan think that in the current market and the highest price point capital growth focus, say 500 to 700,000 are better to hold if you can handle the negative cash flow rather than the lower price point properties at say 300 to 400, which have a positive cash flow when the interest rates are a bit higher. Thus positive cash flow with lower growth is less appealing in the higher interest rate environment. Good question. Big question. Yeah. It is what are your thoughts? I think it depends, doesn't it? A boring, yeah, but, boring sort of answer, but yeah. Yeah. Look, my preference is to buy higher budget locations. My, that's my preference. Um, the reason for that is because you're more likely to benefit from the things that I just talked about in any city. 
Um, so if I was buying in Adelaide um, as an investor, I would be looking at the top end of my budget, whatever my budget is, I would be looking to buy a quality prime piece of real estate that will get the Adelaide return. So, you know, if Adelaide rises 40%, it will get that return because it's a good quality real estate. I would sacrifice a percentage point in yield if I have to, and I would trade that off for a greater, like a better piece of land that is more likely to benefit in the long run because it exhibits qualities that, do well um so a corner when you're when you're doing that redham do you i mean you've got a flourishing business so um that's yeah like you're really kicking goals there but for the would you would you do you increase your buffers and and that so even though you've got a flourishing business like how do you think about that yeah for sure like um anytime we invest in our investing is purely numbers based so it, it's yeah. like our does our financial position allow us to invest? Have we saved enough capital? Do we have too much excess capital beyond our buffers? Like, it doesn't make sense for me to go and invest. So it's like running numbers. I think everyone does that as well to whatever their position is. Um, they work out, hey, look, this is my income. I'm saving this much. I've got this much capital. What am I going to do with this? Um, do I want to store it? Do I need it? What should I do with it? Um, so What's your... I, I do on, on, and on those sort of higher growth sort of areas, what, what is your longer term sort of exit strategy or is there an exit strategy or it's just a retain and create the cash flow, maybe sell one or so? The cash flow ain't great. So, you know, the, these strategies in city <laughs> suck, like cash flow wise, like we have a yeah. parcel of land, the, the, the triple puzzle that I talked about, like the homes on them suck. Zero income. Yeah. Oh, this like, oh, this house is on them now? There's houses on them, yeah. I, like, you know, I don't buy land. It's harder to finance and it's a bit trickier. Yeah, it um, is. But the house on it is literally the skip. Like, I, I think that one of the houses that we own is like the initial house that was the first one in the suburb, if that makes sense. It's complete, it's literally the scariest home you'll ever walk into. Um, so <laughs> freaky. Like, my wife, like, we can't go in because <laughs> we're like, oh, this, this is, this is, I'm surprised someone wants to live here. Um, but there's charm in it too, but you know, not, not for me. You can make a horror movie in it, um, and it'll be like a really good <laughs> horror movie. Um, so, the yields suck, if that makes sense, in Sydney. That's, there's a truth to that. Um, but in going back to the question um, that the buyer was asking, I would personally trade off yield because property itself is a wonderful wealth creation vehicle because of the land that's there and the value rises that occur to that land over time. And I've learned that. So that is why I'd be investing whatever my, my maximum is in whichever city I choose. Um, yeah, for that purpose. And, and I guess that's the thing, right? Um, at the end of the day, you've got to look at what do you what do you care about? Like, let's say you make an extra hundred dollars a week, and that's probably too much, right? Like for 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 cash flow positive, but let, like for what you can actually achieve it, with a half decent growth. But let's say you make five thousand two hundred dollars a year. And then you make five thousand two hundred dollars the next year, and then you make five thousand two hundred dollars the next year, right? You've made twenty six thousand dollars. But what if you could invest in another area that grows at a hundred thousand dollars over that five years. Um, sorry, not well, not over well, hundred thousand over five years is is still very good. But like, what if it's fifty thousand, fifty thousand, fifty thousand, fifty thousand, or one hundred and fifty thousand? But if you're going into these super duper cash flow locations, it, it does get very challenging. So I do get a little bit. I mean, I do get a little bit scared when people say I only want cash flow because in five years' time you're going to be able to grab all of that deposit out that you've already put into it and then go again and then buy another one in the same kind of situation as long as you can afford it, right? You've got to kind of find markets that, I guess, balance out both that have the upside and also have the cash flow. But I think when people focus just on cash flow, it becomes a very challenging, you just, I mean, it's the same situation from right at the beginning that you were talking about there. It just doesn't really work too well. Not financial advice, obviously, but. Something to consider for people that are kind of newer to investing. I hope that answered the, the um, I, I didn't catch their name. I, I didn't pop up. So, um, it doesn't come up, yeah. Facebook yeah, user. Yeah. Facebook, Facebook user, user comes um, up. I hope that answered the question. Um, that's what I would do. But, nice. um, you know, different people will give you different answers. Um, and I am no, like, it's just, I'm one person. So one person different, different stages as well. Um, you know, if you know you, like I have, a, I have someone I'm working with is um, going to become a doctor, right? And um, they know that their income is going to be massive, 
well, not massive, but much larger than it is right now. So they are kind of future, they're, you know, they're going for a growth asset and they know, hey, look, I'm going to be able to afford this challenge over the next five years. But in that future, boom, I'm ready to go. So I'll have that, that when they get their new income, they'll be set off like a rocket with a great capital asset and then a great income to be able to borrow even more to, to go again. Yes, that's true. That, that's a huge part of it, Joe. That's the numbers part um, to one circumstance. Um, and uh, yeah, you run your numbers on your situation. If you can't absorb that loss position um, and stress test it as well, like stress test it to even higher interest rates, you know, stress test it from the current level. If you can't afford that, then you could easily get yourself in a situation where you bought a quality asset, but you need to offload that quality asset before it's mm -hmm. reaped its reward um, because you haven't stress yep. tested yourself enough. Um, and these assets, when you stress test, um, they perform worse than higher yielding assets because those higher yielding assets produce more income. They often cost less, so you're using less money, so you need less buffers. Um, so the stress testing, when you go through that modeling that you would do, um, or when you're running your numbers, you'll find that um, you want to be able to afford that um, over different cycles. Um, yeah, so mm. that, that and really Everyone, we'll, we'll kind of wrap up soon. Um, so everyone throw in your comments and questions about anything that you want to um, ask Brandon. Wealth of, wealth of knowledge here. Um, one question I just wanted to ch ask about uh, us to you is um, how do you look at the the zoning? So you were talking about, let's say we're going to buy in South Australia. Um, they have different zonings like they have everywhere else. Um, they have something called high, de um, high diversity neighbourhood, right? That's that's one to really look out for because it means that they're going hell for leather to make that bit better. Now, do you invest in areas that have already been rezoned? This place here is high density neighbourhood. Or do you say, hey, opposite the street here, there's a shopping centre on this side, high density neighbourhood here. Um, I believe this area is going to be where it's at. But what, how do you kind of think about that? Sure. So we don't, like, I'm not skilled enough to take advantage of high density zoning myself. Like, what am I going to do? I can't. Like, I like working in my office. I, I don't like going out on sites and, and building myself. Um, so uh, I, we, we do that sort of strategy element where it's buy things that are undervalued today that may mm -hmm. change a little bit la later. Um, it's like Moneyball in sports where you're buying like a, a, a person or, a, or, or an asset that looks a certain way but produces more over time because the way you look at it will change um, because it's zoning changes or something like that. Um, so, in other, so in other words, you wouldn't want Liverpool to buy Cristiano Ronaldo at the moment. He's he's uh, he's he's yeah. definitely not undervalued, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Liverpool adopt this strategy. My football team definitely adopt this sort of strategy in the transfer market. Um, they don't have any money, so they they, they have to do something like this. Um, New South, like in New South Wales, it's better if you can understand planning changes. Um, so change in planning is the key if you can understand that in your city in the cities you're operating you know investing in that's what i would be doing um so if i was investing in perth i would be doing every i'd, I'd apply my same sydney mindset my same sydney learnings in perth and understand try to understand as quickly as i can how their planning arrangements work and what changes in planning may occur um new south wales was like i i said it at the time um was the biggest opportunity for smallest small resi developers in decades occurred a couple of years ago um, in New South Wales because there was a statewide, so for the entire New South Wales, um, the state came up with these rules to build duplexes and triplexes. Is that, CD, and, is that CDC compliant yeah, development? CDC. Hmm. Yeah, so at the time, this, this was new. Um, so what we did, just before it came out, like COVID, hmm. COVID did hit, no one knew about it. We went and bought a whole range of assets just that would benefit from this. And next thing you know, the value of these assets after we got plans on them and getting plans via CDC is very easy, very quick. The value of these assets and the certainty of plans increased dramatically and beat the market return over that time because of these planning changes. So if you can understand planning changes in the city you're looking at, maybe you can benefit from that. Um, so that's something that if I was investing in, I would overlay um, on top of the macro data days on listings and stuff like that. I'd be focusing on the micro. It's, it's kind of like that slight edge. This is where the slight edge is at play. Like you, you wouldn't have developed that. I mean, of course, your wife has uh, a bit of an insider's knowledge because she does it for her day to day. 
but for somebody who's sort of starting off doing this, you're going to read the first one of these and you'll be like, it's all going to be double Dutch. But over time, and as you start to pick yeah. up and speak to investors like yourself, or there's many sort of communities out there, including ours, yeah. that, you can, that can help. Just, just clarifying. Hard. Yeah, that's true. Just clarifying. There's no inside information here. All of this is... Oh, yeah, no, yeah. No. When I say just, like a, a more advanced understanding rather than, yeah, not, not insider trading or anything like that. Don't want to... Yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I kind of meant to like for other investors, there's so much information out there. It's just we have small computational abilities in terms of what information should I be looking for and what yeah. information does this actually mean and represent? Um, so Could that... We... that that's that's the tricky bit, and yeah, if you've got experiences, I've got experience in lending and developers, and you know we, we've got clients there, so I, I can so, I can so pick up. Can you chat GPT, Joe? Or, yeah, we can chat GPT. This. Um, <laughs> so, Brenda, when you're looking at these areas, so I, I guess the question I asked before was it's zoned H, you know, high high de- density, high diversity, and you're saying no, I wouldn't buy there. I'd go to the place that's going to get rezoned because this side of the street is going to be slightly cheaper and I'm going to be able to buy it at this, but I've read the plan that they've got in 15 years and everything's pointing to this area here, but you're still taking a bit of a, are you taking a bit of a gamble in doing that or you've got. Yeah, sure. hundred <laughs> percent. That's Doesn't the key like strategy is I like, I, I like high risk property returns. I like to gamble. Like I'm a poker player. It's fun. <laughs> um, you know, I, even when I'm investing, I like it, but t- to be honest, the returns, justify this in my opinion mm-hmm. like you are like yeah if you do 10 of them, right. sorry like if yeah, you do you, 10 of them you you'll lose two and you'll make eight or maybe 10 yeah. is probably a bit too many but and like you, you know what i mean beauty of property i find is the downside of getting it wrong is very limited so you know a little bit of a story i bought a ppor in um Torella, which is uh just near Walai creek um oh, my yeah, wife yeah. and i there was potential planning changes going on at the time. We took a punt. We're like, you know what? This is a corner block. It's a nice. It's nice. It's a couple hundred meters from the station. Man, it ticks a lot of boxes, this spot, this particular lot. It's 15 minutes to the CBD and it's a house. Like pretty good first home to live in. Like let's go live there. We could live there. Um, do, did a little reno. Took a punt being like, maybe this can turn into apartments. They're doing planning changes and this will get part of it. Through the process, like everyone objected to it in the area. Like we went to like council areas and literally people were just screaming at each other They're like you can't do this this is horrible um mm. so it didn't get upsold at all um and it was just like oh crap i bought this property but i didn't pay a margin on it i didn't pay any development premium on it i just bought it as an owner occupier and it just kind of made sense like you know this is a nice owner occupier with investment appeal um a few years later the cdc code came in and next thing you know i, I can't put apartments on this but i can build this beautiful new home at the back of it and oh wow like the development return exists. So the get outs of the get, there's get outs, if that makes sense. If even if you yeah. don't get what you thought, there's get outs yeah. because you still own premium land and good quality land in good areas. Yeah. So um, that's my mm. lessons from this. Um, I think there's thing. there's certainly scarcity at, in that sort of location. So I, I, I would be I would be a bit wary of going and buying in in a in a sort of suburb that's got sort of or like a, a an outer reach regional location <laughs> with a couple of thousand people. And, and expecting that that type of play is going to pay off. I think you'd yeah, want to be true. a little more cautious and, yeah, and wary. True. But some couple of good questions, Joe. You've, I've yeah, let's throw, some, let's throw some crackers out now. Um, does Random have any hot tips about the high-speed rail in Newcastle South? What don't know happens? About. And what areas will benefit? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't, know. I don't know about this, but that sounds really cool. It seems like something I should look into. <laughs> um, uh I, okay, I don't know. Well, actually, but... just before you answer that, what? Okay, you don't know anything about it. What would you do? What would be the first step for you to? What are the steps that you What's would take to achieve this? Yeah, so <laughs> I, I was just about to go into that. So, high speed rail in Newcastle South. I, I would look into what what the project is. Now, if you can identify where the stops will be, so Newcastle South, uh, maybe it goes through Gosford. Well, uh, my geography might be poor here, but maybe it goes yeah, through. It'll Gosford. go through Gosford. Cool. So I, I don't like, I don't know these areas particularly well, but if there's a stop in Gosford, what is around that stop? Where would that stop likely be? You know, you won't have that information if it's just in its mm-hmm. early planning phase. But property is really slow. They'll release the location and people won't know about it. I love this about property. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's so much information asymmetry. People just don't know. They don't pay attention to this stuff and it doesn't get the limelight. So there'll be a stop. There'll be a location. They'll show it on a map, but no one will pick it up. I would wait till that information, comprehend that information, and then buy around that stop. Um, find the right asset around there. 
Did, did you um did you look much at the um the Western Sydney sort of airport or did you not sort of yeah. do do much around that? So one of our, our side by side play that I kind of mentioned um it's in a little bit of a strategic spot because uh, the particular suburb I don't, I don't really want to go into it but the particular suburb um that where we purchased um. That would be a good spot, a great spot. And a lot of our clients actually have yeah. purchased out there, but um, yeah. has a railway that goes through. Um, so the railway ha will have to connect to this station for the future mm -hmm. airport. So uh, we did the math being like, if you are building a railway to this new airport, how do you get from one station, the mascot station that's here, um, to the other station? Because they need to connect. Like, that's just pretty obvious airports need to connect to each other and an airport mm -hmm. even out west needs to connect to the cbd or para how would that connection be built um so that like that was part of the the planning element there so we did look into this yeah wow. i think the interesting ones the sort of saint mary's the other way to, to badger's creek through sort of glenmore park and I, I, i'm not i'm not sold on those sort of like it'll go okay but i just think there's a lot of land farmland out there but anyway, um, I don't know the area, but I would look into that for sure. Like I'd look into say, yeah, I, I was yeah, looking. No, I, I just, I just, yeah, I grew up in the area, so I sort of just think that there's, there's a lot of cows and like Leppington getting three fifty k budget buy now wait. We could all answer this question. What, what do you think, Rodham? Uh, where? Um, ah, uh, three fifty. Oh, where is somebody buying three fifty k? Yeah, yeah. Joke. Okay, can I go last? Ah, <laughs> uh, if you come to me with three hundred fifty k, um, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't feel comfortable finding an investment grade property as much. So yeah, for it's, me, I'd say yeah. for me, I like, yeah, I'd say wait. Um, but oh, I don't know. It's hard. Well, it depends on what you can do. Like if you can buy something that's really run down and you can add value to, and you, you put a little bit of sweat equity into it, you can create that equity. And then in, in, a, in a year's time, you, it's now worth 420,000. Awesome. Mm. Go ahead and go ahead and do it. Um, but if you're looking for a set and forget it, 350,000, um it's 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 probably not gonna it's probably not gonna grow too too much like like a, i like to say over the boom of the last two years property prices have moved quite a lot and if this property hasn't moved from 350k what more does it need like what what more does it need to to, to send it off to the moon um it's probably going to be one of these cash flow assets that are like uh mining booms mining towns all that kind of stuff wow what about you, Jeff? Savage, isn't it? What about you, Jeff? Yeah, that was savage. <laughs> <laughs> Try and be a little bit direct. <laughs> okay. Um, I, look, the buy now or wait. I don't have information from Facebook user again. Um, uh, as to um, what wait means for you, if wait means for you that you can increase your budget to five hundred thousand, six hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand at some point in the next mm. couple of years because you can save more of a deposit and you've got the serviceability there. Then I would agree with um, Joe there. Wait, because um, you can buy something better. But if waiting is simply market dependent, like if you're just waiting for the market to fall more, and if, if that's yeah. what you're talking about, then I think there's somewhere in the country where you can invest for three hundred fifty thousand now and do well. Um, so I would. Yeah. I don't, I don't know the answer to where, unfortunately, but um, so I can't help there. But um, there are people and other professionals like Joe that can help navigate that path for you. Yeah, and actually, it's a good point because if you're waiting to increase, uh, like if you've got four hundred thousand, you're going to get a lot better options. Like if you're if you're trying to do that, um, what do you reckon, Joe? It's starting to get a bit tougher around the four, even the four hundred. I mean, there's there's options around, but um, yeah. You, you even even sort of say because the other challenge you sort of say is if you're waiting to if you're waiting for something for your for your budget to increase and uh, it's it's kind of being very clear on on what parameters need need for that to happen because if if you if you're waiting a year and 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 that situation doesn't happen then then what happen what happens then do you just keep waiting like when do when does the waiting mm. ever stop it's like the yeah. um, but if you, if you, yeah, if you're saving more money though, right? Like, I mean, and also, is there access to different funds, right? My first investment property was a was a renovator. Um, I used a, I didn't, I had, you know, sixty thousand dollars. It was either get a set and forget with a deposit, um, but I used a guarantor loan and bought a renovated delight. The guarantor loan was the security on the property. I renovated the property with the $60,000. The property was then worth $360,000. I released the guarantor loan, and then I owned that property at that rate. 
Um, so there's other strategic things that you can do. Um, this session, mate, Reddit has been unreal. We definitely have to get you on and I definitely have to listen to your podcast because I, I know everyone can can take away from that. Um, what, what, what's the podcast? Have you got any? Um, have you got anything yeah, to share? Uh, yeah, oh, it's called it? Australian Property Talk. I'm, I'm more than happy to share it. We just started it, to be honest. We, um, it's kind of, uh, I know very little about podcasts. Um, uh, I've got two <laughs> young kids, so I've been away from contenting for a, a little while. Um, but uh, Australian Property Talk, we release episodes every week. Um, it's me and Curtis. You've got Rose. it on your website as the Australia, uh, one, of, one of Australia's fastest growing property podcasts. There yeah, you you've go. got well, a thousand downloads. Percentage-wise. Like, yeah. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know if this is good or not, but I've spoken to other people. We're like, we've got to a thousand downloads per episode inside like sixty days. Um, and I've done no marketing yet. I'm just like, wow, it's podcasting like is Maybe awesome, well, right? <laughs> Sorry, uh, I, I don't even think we're at a thousand downloads. To be fair, no, I'm sure we like, are coming. Well, you've got to try harder than them. To be honest, I don't. I don't even know how to. Pop. I don't yeah, know how podcast. to well this this gets turned into a podcast. Oh, I don't know how to look at it. I don't know how to look at the, I don't know where the metrics are, but I've, I thought a thousands. I thought yeah. a thousands quite an achievement. But I tell you what, it's probably it's the it's the name. It's, that's one of the best things that we did on this group was call it Oz Property Investors because that's exactly right. what it is: Australian property investors, and and it gets picked up by whatever yeah. social media. We have a lot of fun talking that's, about. That's it. really I'm sorry. Yeah. Anyway, sorry guys, we we went on a tangent there, but. Redham, how can people learn more about you? So we, you've got the amazing podcast um, if they need help with them. But alone, I imagine you could help them out. What's, what's the go with the, that business? Yeah, so I run Confidence Finance, a mortgage broken business. Um, so me and my business partner, Curtis, um, he's our numbers guru. You can reach out to him, um, you know, confidencefinance.com.au. You can reach us there. Um, any questions about our podcast, if you want more content and information we release you know, we've got an SVB bank collapse episode, an episode on the housing story and things like that. Um, you know, every week we have a podcast episode. That's probably the best best, best place to hear more from us. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on, Redham, and, and sharing the value and wisdom and and being like you're actually sharing the, the, the sort of tactical insights because a lot of investors can be a bit cagey. So, and um, yes, yeah, so many different rabbit holes could have gone down so i really appreciate what you're um what you're doing to the industry and just getting getting out there and getting amongst it and i'm sure liverpool eventually will get back to the top of the i mean i'm a man you fan so we've been horrible for ages <laughs> my pleasure gents it was lovely meeting you both and doing this with you it's always fun talking property and you guys both have a lot to share and a lot of knowledge so it was just a lot of fun <laughs> and the, the, that i really enjoy so thanks joe thanks jeff I thoroughly enjoyed it, mate. Thank you very much, Redham. Have a great one. We'll catch up soon. Let's do it.